will now. Thanks, Marina. <laughs> right, welcome everybody. Um, we've got most of the attendees on. We'll just everybody else can join as we go along. Um, I'll hand over to Emma um, from CRT to do the welcomes and introductions. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, this session is part of the IWA and Canal and River Trust training and workshop programme for 2023-24. As Jenny said, my name's Emma and I'm a project manager for the Canal and River Trust. We've also got Verena from IWA joining us today. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Verena Leonardini and I am Events and Restoration Hub Coordinator for the IWA. And we've also got Jenny from the IWA joining us as well. Yeah, hi, I'm Jenny. I do the volunteer manager um, work within the IWA. Okay, so for today's webinar, we're joined by George Rogers from Chesterfield Canal um, Trust and Sue Higton from uh, Canal and River Trust as our guest speakers. Um, and we're uh, delighted to be covering the topic um, of permissions and licensing for restoration projects in today's uh, session. So I'm just going to hand over to Verena now, who's going to go through a bit of housekeeping before we start. Right, thank you, Emma. Um, so all attendees will have their microphones muted and cameras switched off. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please add them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we will address as many of these as possible at the end of the session. I know uh, most of you have found the chat box and introduced yourself already. So please flee, feel free to use the chat box uh, during the webinar at any time to comment or share your experiences with others. But remember to change the chat option to all panelists and attendees so that your comments uh, will appear to us all. It's important to use the Q&A feature uh, for any questions as questions submitted in a, into the chat box might get lost. Also, we will be recording the webinar uh, and the link for it will be shared uh, in due course so you can refer back to it at any time. And on that note, I will hand over to Susan. Hello everybody, I'm Sue Higton. I'm a works engineer in the infrastructure services team. Uh, just bear with me a minute, let me get this thing working properly. Uh, I'm struggling to share my screen. Can everybody see my presentation? Yeah, thank you. Right, as I said, I'm a works engineer with the infrastructure services team. I've been with the trust since January 2017. And prior to that, I worked for the best part of 30 years at the local authority. So I've been involved in municipal engineering of one sort or another for lots of years, more than I care to mention. The infrastructure services team, our main role is protect our infrastructure and canals from the possible impacts of any work being carried out by third parties. So by third party, I don't mean volunteers, they're normally managed by internal volunteer managers at the Trust, so they effectively classed as employees for the purpose of this. This is other third parties that could be councils, private developers, adjacent landowners. So we would have to look at their proposals and check what possible impact it could have on the canal or the towpath or other structures and issue notices and permits for those works as appropriate. We're quite a self-funding team. We charge fees for our permits, etc. cetera. Uh, last year, we brought in 3.1 million pounds to the trust, which sort of pays for ourselves. And then the surplus goes into our own schemes for maintenance, particularly winter maintenance projects. The forecast this year at the moment is £2.7 million. So we're on track for another good year. 
unfortunately we, we never know what work is going to come in of a year it all depends who is developing what alongside the canals we've not got much control on that so the team is made up of the manager four area managers nine engineers of which i'm one four inspectors and two admin staff um, we manage all the schemes through a database uh, when I wrote this on Friday, we had 1,398 live schemes. That's now gone up to 1,410. So as you can see, we're pretty busy. I've had three new applications in one day. So th there's lots going on out there. Uh, but some of those, those schemes have been ongoing for several years and some are very quick in and out. <clears throat> um, what I'm showing here is obviously the, the team set up the the light blue colours are the southern half of the country, the dark blue is the northern half. And although I sit in the north team, I cover half of the northwest and half of the West Midlands. So I've got about 300 miles of canals that I cover um, for the various works. Generally, we cover uh, sites within about two hours drive radius of home. Um, try and keep people fairly local in that way. Now, all the third party work schemes are managed through our code of practice. So, any work that could impact us in any way needs to come through the code of practice. And it's split into three sections, as I've detailed there. And I've put the link at the bottom there to the code of practice on the website. I'll put that in the chat later as well for, for people to access. Um, so it, it could range from simple bridge inspections where the contractor comes in and does an inspection with a temporary pontoon and a, a small scaffold taking less than a day, or it could be a temporary scaffold over the canal for 12 months for a major building project. It's all sort of scales and works, all locations, so it's nice and varied. This list is referring back to part two of the code of practice. There is specialist sections in there for each of these. So obviously some of these will apply to restoration schemes. A lot will not, that's fine. The code of practice is quite daunting if you've not looked at it before. And the application forms are as well, but it's sort of important to bear in mind that the code of practice is designed to catch any type of work. So if your work is really, really simple, you might not have any interaction with us other than needing to issue notice and a permit, or it might be a much more complex scheme where you've got services in the towpath being affected, you could have scaffolding, you could have crane over sale, you could have demolition and new build next to the towpath. It's really wide ranging the sort of schemes that we cover. So I thought what would be useful would to look, be looking at um, a scheme that I've currently been managing through the Code of Practice, which is on the Montgomery Canal, just as an illustration of how the new bridge construction on the Montgomery Canal ties into the Code of Practice and what involvement we've had there. So you probably know the Montgomery Canal fell into disuse back in the 30s. Uh, Schoolhouse Bridge, Bridge 86, was replaced with an embankment um, which had just got a small piped culvert effect through it to carry any surplus water. Now, obviously, as the restoration of the canal is ongoing, we're down to the last two miles on the English side of the border, but this bridge is in the way. Obviously, you can't get a boat through a culvert, so we needed to replace the bridge. The planning approval for the replacement bridge was granted in 2019. That was a joint planning application between the Trust and the Restoration Trust. And following on from there, various works have been taking place in phased developments effectively. So for the new bridge, we entered into a three-way deed of grant with Montgomery Canal Reconstruction and the Shropshire Council. So MCRL are acting as the principal contractor and also the client for the subcontract works. They're doing all the works for the preparation for the new bridge and the reconstruction of the bridge itself. 
and then on completion, the completed new bridge will be handed over to Shropshire Council to be the new owners and to maintain it going forward. So some of the construction works, the prep works have been carried out by volunteers, some by IWA working parties, and then the most recent section, which is the bridge, is a specialist bridge contractor. So MCRL submitted a code of practice application to us, and I've been issuing permits for phase, various phases of the works through that with them as the third party. So I appreciate these are very small on your screen. The picture on the left is obviously a plan view. The blue is the proper route of the canal, which will be restored and shows the bridge location and the new steps just to the top side of the bridge there. And the picture on the right shows just how we needed to raise the level of the road over the canal so that we can get sufficient headroom in there to reconstruct the canal through. Obviously the bed of the canal at the moment is just dry grass. It's a, a major reconstruction project and it's getting ever closer to the bridge. But hopefully the bridge will be completed very shortly before Christmas, certainly. So the various phases that we've gone through on this one. Um, in September 20, uh, the volunteers constructed a temporary roadway around the bridge. This enabled the bridge itself to be closed to traffic for the diversion of a seven trent water main, which was in the structure of the road over the old embankment. So that had got to be diverted before we could start building the new bridge. So once the new roadway was in place, the water main was then diverted under the canal. That was carried out by contractors from the select list provided by Seven Trent. And the diversion had to be at sufficient depth that it would be at least 3.5 metres below the bed of the restored canal once those works are completed. That's a standard requirement for any services passing under the canal. In April 21, we then approved discharge of surface water from the surface of the new bridge. This only takes the water from the bridge itself, not from the highway at either side of the bridge. And that water will be discharged into the canal, well, into the dry bed at the moment, and then into the completed canal, ultimately. Um, we're not charging for that discharge in this instance, but we wanted to formally record it so that the amount of water coming in, although it's very small, uh, so that that can be included in hydrological calculations for the restoration of the remainder of the canal. Also in 21 and 22, we issued various permits for vegetation removal, uh, hedge removal, that sort of thing, in preparation for the construction of the bridge itself. And then in April 23, the work to remove the existing embankment and construct the new bridge started. Uh, works are ongoing with that one. So all traffic is still using the temporary roadway around the bridge. It's just a stone track, it's not surface, but it's, it's ideal. It's a very small country road anyway, but that's providing a route so that it's not disrupting locals, uh, farmers, that sort of thing around the area. And then obviously that trackway will be removed once the bridge is complete and the road is back open and operational. So these two photos, the photo on the left is taken from in the bed of the dry canal. Um, you can see the white cottage there in the background that was on the, the earlier plan. And just in front of the cottage is the raised embankment section that was built to replace the old roadway. That has now been removed. And if you see on the right, you can still see the end of the cottage. And we have a nice new bridge coming in with new ramped road access up to that bridge and gabion wing walls, etc. Obviously, there were a lot of discussions with the council about the bridge itself. Obviously, it's not the, the same design bridge that was there originally. And the wing walls on the bridge itself will become under the ownership of Shropshire Council. So there's had to be land exchange of some of our own land in the areas where the wing walls are 
corresponds to the party line next to for the windows and the access onto the towpath, which is the opposite side of the bridge from, from where you can see here. As I say, it's an ongoing scheme. It's been an awful lot of to and fro in getting to this point, but it's really good to see it actually happening on site and the work's all going ahead. So that really is me in a nutshell and how the code of practice can apply to restoration schemes. I realise it's a very brief overview, but if you have any questions, happy to answer whatever I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. That was, uh, was interesting from my point of view because it's, it's it's quite interesting seeing how um how this works on sort of the the, the connected network and um you know what, what I'll have to do when I eventually get to the CRT part at Chesterfield. So that that's that's quite useful. Um, we have had a few questions come in that will um I'll put to you now before I go on to sort of my my section of this. Um, so Chris Nash has asked, uh, I think it was back on slide two, right back towards the beginning of your presentation, you yeah. referenced an SWD assessment. So he's just asked, what does SWD assessment mean? Apologies, that's surface water discharge. Marvellous, so, thank you very much. Um, well, the, the point to make with that, I suppose, is that people automatically think that the canals need the extra water. So a lot of developments ask if they can put surface water into the canal. A lot of local water authorities are refusing surface water into their systems now. So under the hierarchy of looking at alternative drainage arrangements, if the canal is there, it's a good one to consider. But we don't always need the water when other sites are trying to get rid of the water. We've usually got enough when it's raining. So it, we can't always accept surface water from development sites. Um, but if we do, it has to go through a quite a detailed assessment process and then would need to be a, a license to agree that ongoing arrangement. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, then Terry has asked, does the third party works team scope include all of the remainder canals? Um, if the land is in our ownership, then yes code of practice would apply if we don't own the land then no basically yeah yeah no i think that's that's clear enough thank you very much um and i was going to actually ask a related question on this probably for clarity about um if you, you obviously mentioned right at the beginning that volunteers come under generally your sort of internal volunteer management i'm assuming that of course relates to your crt volunteers and not you know your yes. restoration teams in this case are a third party yes correct yeah. yeah yeah that's fine uh chris nash has then asked another one which is saying uh, does a visual condition survey of a remainder canal require a permit or just notification of when where and what will take place if it's just visual and there's no intrusive works it's just nice to know that something's going on but it doesn't require a permit no yeah i'm assuming that though also does relate to assuming that there's open access to that to that land you know you can walk along yeah. it on a footpath etc if you were obviously having to go on to land that didn't have access that probably would be different wouldn't it yes yeah yeah Okay, and uh, Bill Nicholson has then asked the final question, which is one I was also going to ask, was you said something about minimum depth for services. Uh, yeah. what, what, what was your minimum depth that you mentioned? Um, if it's going under the bed of the canal, it needs to be at least 3.5 metres below the hard bed of the canal to the crown of the surface. Service. Okay, that's, so. that's um, it. Yeah, that's very deep. <laughs> <laughs> Realistically, they're quite often deeper than that because um, under a live canal especially, it would be installed by um, directional drilling mm. or something like that rather than open cut. So to get the angle to dip down, that you have to be quite a long way back. So very often they're, they're probably six or nine metres below the canal as an average, I would say. But yeah, 3.5 is the, the minimum, yeah. Marvellous. I'm working on some diversions at Chesterfield at the moment, and we're definitely trying to get them quite a lot shallower than that. But right, um, <laughs> not a CRT canal, so at the moment, so okay, <laughs> marvelous. I think that's all. Oh no, I was going to say there are more questions come in. Um, so the first one is another one from Terry. Um, from a budgeting perspective, do restoration groups need to pay for the third party works approvals? 
and assuming yes at what level of granularity you know is it per phase or one fee for a whole scheme depends very much on the funding for the project itself and um, in this instance at schoolhouse bridge it was a project that we would have done ourselves if the restoration group hadn't taken it on so we waived the fees for this one um, but there would be fees that apply to every phase um, we can only provide a, a fee estimate at the start of works and um, if we don't waive all the fees we might be able to waive some of them but it's on a case-by-case -case basis realistically so um, yeah it like I say it basically depends on where the funding is coming from as well and yeah Okay, no, it's marvellous. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that there is one more question from Paul in the Q&A box. Um, but I think I will, if I go on to my presentation, that the that question will partially get answered in in, in that um, in my section. So, uh, Paul, if I if I don't answer it fully, we'll we'll come back to it at the end. Um, okay. Right. I'll put my uh, make sure I get the right screen up. Um, okay so um well thank you very much for that sue that was very interesting i'm going to move on a little bit to sort of more general points on consents and permissions um as i suspect many of you will know um i am the development manager for the chesterfield canal trust um i'm a long-term work volunteer and sort of part of the work board but uh for the last four and a half years Canal restoration has been my day job um, with with Chesterfield Canal Trust. Uh, I do a couple of other things as well: sites group with work, um, sit on the high level panel, etc. So a few hats in this. This bit about consents and permissions, it's very much going to be a whistle stop tour because you know basically I've got half an hour or so, and um, there's a lot in this topic, so it will be a very whistle stop tour. Um, if you've got particular areas of it that are really of interest, let us know. And equally, if there are things we can't answer but warrant more time, then obviously we'll look to put them into the um, the, the programme of webinars, etc. going forward. I think also it's worth me just saying at, right up front that my attitude to working with consents and agreements is they're there for a reason and just get on and do it and get on and work with them um this is not to this is not to denigrate any societies but i do know of various people who whose attitude is tends to be more about trying to find a way around consent permissions and and that's very much not who i am so just sort of have that in mind as as i talk through what i uh, what 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 i'm going to talk through um just to lay a bit of context for my project um so this is the chesterfield canal 46 miles long at the moment basically what is left to restore is a is a eight and a half mile gap in the in the middle um that runs from staveley just outside chesterfield up towards kiverton which goes up towards workshop and retford and our current scheme is a very in the grand scheme of things quite a small little corner of this which is um, about between quarter and half a mile of reasonably significant restoration efforts. So um, basically, there's a there's a there's an old bridge. Uh, this is all tied up with HS2. Um, we do not have time to get into HS2 today. Um, there's then a new lock that we are building, a new bridleway bridge, sort of this two span, thirty five meters and twelve meters. Um, and then a new sort of accommodation bridge and and then a load of earthworks going out to the east. And uh, as I just alluded to, underneath this section are two water mains, two gas, uh, a gas main and two sewers that we're having to deal with. So all in all, it's currently a £6.2 million scheme to get um, about a quarter of a mile. And uh, this is what it looks like today um, or well, it probably does look like this today. It is this is it is sunny here? Um, so ultimately, this is taking the, the the canal is sort of we're hovering over it basically. We come through the railway, the new bridleway bridge goes over here, and then we go out into that sort of. You can basically see the old line of the canal, and I have put this photo in partially for Paul's question about um, the original 
Paul, so Paul's question, which I'll, I'll sort of get to as I go through the, this presentation, is the original course of the canal has been built over in two places, first with a dual carriageway and secondly a housing estate. So what are the requirements for the diversion and the building of locks apart from the purchase of the land? So on that basis, I'm essentially taking that as, right, OK, we've got to build a new section of canal through a essentially a green piece of land. What do we need to do? And I'm sure there's more detail to that. But if you look at what we've got to do whilst we are actually on this, in this case, following the original line, it is fundamentally the same problem. There's no canal there at the moment. It's long since disappeared. We've got to build a, a section of canal through the middle of green space. So on that scheme, we have a quite an extensive schedule of all the legal agreements and all the consents that we need. And for purposes of the rest of this presentation, um, I'm going to talk through some of them, uh, some of the headings um, and some of the sort of detail on all of them. I will not have time to go into them all. Um, and I think you will all, anybody who's been doing this for any time will probably find at least one consent that I've missed off this list. Please feel free to drop it into the Q&A or the chat so that either I know about it and deal with it for my scheme or um, I can we can talk about it and um, sort of reference why it's not on my list, for example. So in on my current project, the various headings we've got, essentially legal agreements, the original planning consent, um, then there's various planning conditions. We've got rights of way that we need to divert. There's a we're in a coal mining area, so we have coal authority permit issues. There's obviously then various ecology and environmental permits. Um, the clay planning consent, I won't talk too much about. That's a that's a scheme quirk, really. And then there's a couple of other external approvals. So if I look at legal agreements, um, you'll be pleased to know I have shortened this list down from the um, I've not shown you all 42 of them. But basically, we have a lot of because uh, these are all tied up quite closely with consent. So um, we have things like funding agreements. Um, this scheme has got about six sources of funding at this precise moment. All of those have a different legal agreement that we have to comply with. There's then obviously various land agreements we need. So at this moment in time, the Chesterfield Canal Trust doesn't own any of the land. We're in negotiations for um, either purchasing it or acquiring a long leasehold on all of it. Aside from the sort of area of the permanent works that we're looking to acquire for um, looking to acquire or lease, we've then got various areas outside of that that we need access to for working. So there are various um, licenses with all of the adjacent landowners so that we can get access for working space and sort of construction traffic and the like. We then have obviously various suppliers and consultants, etc., that work with us. Uh, they all obviously have some form of contract. They won't go through those. Um, you then have so, some more specialist agreements that we need. So we have to cross over the railway line to do our works. It's not a live railway anymore, um, although Network Rail do actually still consider it to be live, despite the fact it's not had track for about 15 years now. Um, and because they still own the assets, there's various sort of we need a license to access that. We need a, an asset protection agreement to which details how we protect the Network Rail assets. And then um, there's also a permanent easement. We then also have the TPT bridge. So I think similar to the what similar to School House Bridge that Sue was just talking about, our big bridleway bridge is going to be adopted by the local council. Um, we're going to construct that first and then that will be handled under an adoption agreement. Um, we have to connect the new section of canal to the old section. And in our case, the old the, the current section is owned and operated by the local council, but our section will be owned and operated by us as the Canal Trust initially. Um, so we need to handle the connection arrangements, who's responsible for what. Um, obviously, water passes between the two sections of canal. There's various licensing issues in that that we'll come to in a bit. Um, and things like who's responsible for maintenance, boat licensing, boat licensing, etc. So there's a whole load of stuff in there. We then have, um, obviously, the uh, access was under Network Rail, uh, another consultant in the archaeologist. We've got a water supply route that we need to install. That's over third party land, so an easement for to, to deal with that. And then finally, a couple of um, 
ones that are relatively new to me here. So there's a section 278, which is where we're putting our construction compound, connecting a new hammerhead into that construction compound so that we've got road access into it. And that will actually stay um, in situ afterwards to give access to that area in the long term. And then finally, a sort of connect a drainage connection into the sewage network. So that's sort of a long list of legal agreements. Um, and I want to then go through some of the other headings in perhaps a bit more sort of interesting detail and sort of move this more towards consents in particular. So I'm going to start with planning permission. Um, and this is often a, an interesting one and one that opens up quite a lot of debate in canal restoration, I think it's fair to say, um, because obviously there are certain rights under permitted development that you have for certain activities and certain events. Um, generally, and you would you would near enough have to talk to your local planning officers um, to sort of know their opinion on this. But in my experience, it's not generally going to work if you just claim that your restoration is a big repair job. Um, and if it's a, just a big repair job, then yes, arguably it could be covered under permitted development. But when your canal, if your canal doesn't have water and actually your stru structures don't exist, that you've moved beyond repair in most planners' eyes and you are now basically doing engineering construction works and therefore you will pretty much require planning consent. Um, I'm not going to have a long debate over that one. I think that's one that if you if you if you want to argue the permitted development rights, it's worth speaking to our planning advisory panel and your local planning officers. But in general, if you were if you were sort of just repairing a lock structure, um, you know, repointing, maybe resetting coping stones, etc., I think you might get away with permitted development. If you start putting new gates on it and putting water in it, at that point, it's less of a repair and more of sort of moving it beyond that. Um, so I think it's worth sort of going through a little bit the planning process that we went through on this scheme. Um, this, uh, the drawing I put up here is basically the extents that we applied for at the time. It's everything that's left in the Chesterfield Borough area. It's 2.6 kilometres of canal from Staveley through to um, the borough boundary. Um, one thing that's always worth remembering with planning consent in particular is that for works like this, which are basically engineering operations, the planning fee tends to be capped at about, it's about £2,050 from last memory. Um, whereas like a housing application, etc., would be based on area. Um, so you want to try and keep it nice and small and, you know, just work out exactly what you need because an engineering operation isn't quite so um, constrained. We actually took the opportunity in this to push some of the boundaries out a little bit further than we might have actually strictly need for the canal. And that's twofold, really. It's a um, it's it, it's partially just about giving ourselves some room when the design evolves. So as the designs evolved here, for example, the embankment that a lot of this canal on as is on as um the, the the angles of the sides of that embankment have got a bit shallower so the embankment's got a bit wider so we're giving ourselves a bit of room it also in some places gives us a bit of scope for just tweaking the alignment one way or another because we can do that under by varying the conditions rather than having to if we started going outside the red line we'd have to revisit the planning so that was some sort of an opportunity we took um and then if i could work out what i've done with the mouse um obviously alongside that that's the site layout plan so it's just sort of the red line plan that you have to put in for planning obviously we had to submit a lot of information with it so we had things like the, the general arrangement drawings so here you can see the railway um the lock the the bridge that we're building um this is all compliant with HS2, so I now have a revised application to make to address the address the HS2 issue. Um, we do things like sort of drainage. So in this case, the embankment is coming up towards the the floodplain. So the the dotted blue is all the floodplain. So we've got some encroachment onto the floodplain as part of the works, and then that comes into other consents that we'll get to later on. Um, so this was sort of drainage plans. You've then also got 
um, things like in our case the public rights of way. So the in this drawing you'll find that the dashed lines are all the current rights of way of different status. Um, we'll get to that in a little while and sort of then the, the revised plans for those rights of way. And basically alongside all of those sort of drawings, we obviously then have a whole series of reports that we have to address. So um, for this one, we did, uh, we had the planning statement, the flood risk assessment, numerous ecology surveys, and they of course are ongoing because um, ecology doesn't stay still. Um, a lot of ground investigation work. So we're in a coal mining area. That meant we did a coal mining risk assessment. Uh, that's obviously then prompted some further work that we've needed to do. Um, there's a heritage statement and in our case, a water framework assessment. What we there are a few things in here that we um, that you might sometimes see that we haven't done. So there was no arboricultural survey done at this point in time. We've had we've done that since. Um, it this application obviously predates the biodiversity net gain um, coming in and it's not been adopted as a policy by the local council yet either so um, I know in some areas they're subject to biodiversity net gain already because the local planning authorities have made it a policy earlier um, we weren't subject to some of that um, before this application went in, we did a environmental impact screening assessment. So basically we we set out what we thought the um, environmental impacts were going to be on a very sort of high level, not just ecology, but things like the landscape and um, sort of, you know, the, the um, noise and vibration and all of that sort of thing. Um, we submitted that to the planning authority basically for an opinion on whether we needed a full environmental impact assessment or not. Um, and thankfully, they agreed with us that we didn't because we weren't going to make that significant a change. Um, but that was a sort of stage we went through because otherwise we would have had to do quite a lot more work in, in, in the environmental side of things. And a lot of this obviously came from talking to the planning officer, you know, pre-application, going to them, giving them the drawings, saying this is roughly what we're doing. Um, what do you think we need? I think the last point before I leave this slide from my point of view was on the ecology surveys. Um, we quite deliberately took all the surveys to a reasonable level. So you can do sort of your initial screening surveys. And then you do your phase two surveys where you actually start properly assessing for individual species. So in our cases, we were looking at great crested newts, otters, water voles, um, reptiles, nesting birds. We've just we've, we've now discovered sand martins and we've got a butterfly issue on an adjacent bit of a site. Which, so it's all, it's, 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 it's all interesting um, and challenging. Oh, and badgers. We do have some issues with badges, which I'll come to in a bit. Um, but we took all of those surveys to phase two before the planning application. Um, and that's partially based on my experience elsewhere with other canal trusts that if you don't do that, you're just going to get um, pushback from the wildlife trust, etc. saying basically saying, well, you need to do this before the application can be granted. Um, and whilst obviously your planning authority may or may not Pay attention to those comments. That's sometimes their prerogative. Um, we just decided to head it all off by doing it before we actually, um, before we put the application in. And we were doing a lot of back and forth with HS2 at the time as well. So that sort of, that that's the planning consent submission that was made. And that's the top of my sort of planning list. And so the second one is a, a revision I need to do at the moment for the area around HS2. That consent was granted. Um, it went through reasonably quickly in the end. We submitted that in June 2020, um, so during COVID, in the early days of COVID. And then it was actually granted in April 21. Um, it Obviously, in theory, it should have been quicker than that, but most of that delay was basically around the final negotiations with HS2 as to what design would be acceptable. Um, the application was was basically ready to be determined apart from HS2 within the sort of three or four months that the planning authorities in theory have. 
That consent has led to a nice long list of planning conditions. Uh, we have 19 planning conditions to discharge. It's not actually that many for a scheme of this sort of size. Um, you know, if you looked at a developer housing scheme sort of of this sort of magnitude, I think you'd be looking at at least double that in terms of the number of conditions. Part of that is because of the work we did in advance. Um, and I think part of it is just a friendly planning authority that actually just want the canal to be restored. Um, but we've had various conditions to address. So, as I said, we're coal mining area, so they wanted to know more about the ground stability. Obviously, wanted to look at ground contamination. So we've done what are known as the phase one surveys to start um, to start investigating the contamination and sort of looking at it from a desktop point of view, but then taking that further and doing the sort of intrusive works. There's then various environmental and ec ecological management plans, the landscaping schemes that, you know, they exist on the drawings that were put in for planning, but taking those to the next level of detail. Uh, flood storage design, because as I said earlier, we were intruding into the floodplain. So there's some detailed design work to do for the flood storage, protection measures for the sewers and the um, various utilities. And then some issues around drainage and how we're going to manage and maintain um, archaeology and sort of details on the bridge. Um, and then finally, the construction method statement, which is a sort of it's a relatively all encompassing condition to capture things like traffic management. Um, and you sort of essentially it's just almost rather similar to a construction phase plan for for CDM, but looking at it from a slightly different slightly different perspective. So we're working through discharging all of those at the moment. There's, um, as you can see on the right, um, we have obviously some of them are done by the designer, some by the contractor, some by the ecologist, etc. So those all get parceled out and are being discharged at the moment. Um, we've also alongside the, we've just done the application for the first set of these to be discharged. And alongside that, we've also done an application to vary a couple of these conditions slightly. Um, most of these have been written in a way that means that it can be phased. So we, we're we obviously delivering 2.6 kilometres, but we're not doing it all at once. So there's some of them have been allowed to be phased so that we can just discharge it for the first 500 metres, not worry about everything further upstream. Um, a couple of them, man we managed to miss phasing them um, in the final discussions with the planning authority. So we're tweaking those um, and actually using the variation to clarify the scope of one of the conditions because it's not entirely clear. So that's all going on at the moment. They're all different sorts of applications. And at some point, we'll have to go back and vary some of the um, conditions around the drawings that are being that it's being based on because there's been a few tweaks in design, etc. Um, but that's sort of it's sort of an ongoing process. And then on in terms of my original list, sort of basically then we come to all the other consents that are on my list for the moment for this scheme. Um, you'll be pleased to know we'll not talk about all of them. Um, the first one from us, from our point of view, is public rights of way. So as you remember earlier on, I showed you a picture of the some of the rights of way that exist on the scheme. Um, and we need to divert a reasonable number of those as part of the canal. So some of the rights of way will now obviously move up back onto the towpath where they've his historically had to move off the towpath. Um, as we build a new bridge, we need to realign the rights of way over that bridge and sort of connecting to it, etc. Uh, that requires the public path orders. Um, these are done in this case by the local planning authority, so Chesterfield Borough Council in our case. Um, public rights of way are generally a um, dist uh, a, a county sort of level uh, issue. They're normally the the highway authority that would deal with this sort of thing because it's under because it's as a result of a planning application. The order is actually made by the local planning authority, um, but the temporary orders where we need sort of temporary diversions that's done by the highway authority just to keep things nice and um, confusing. Um, and so this order's in the process of. I know it says 2022. I mean, this is actually still the draft that we're still discussing. It's not actually been published yet. Um, and that sets out sort of some of the routes. So you've got the original routes here in solid black and then all the various new bits that need to go in in dotted, uh, dotted black. And then elsewhere on that list, as I said, you've got temporary rights of way closures that we 
um, that we need. They'll be dealt with by, generally be dealt with by the contractors as part of their works. We have the coal authority. Um, so because we're in a coal mining area, um, we have to assess the ground stability. That means we have to drill very deep holes into the ground to understand what the conditions are like, how much um, subsurface mining has been taking place. In our cases, we had approximately 20 boreholes over the first half of the scheme that have gone down to between 30 and 40 metres to sort of double check various things. Um, the coal authority, as soon as you are going to drill into their um, into into the coal measures, want uh, need you to have a permit. That was pretty painful to achieve, to be honest. Um, not really because of the permit itself, because that's actually relatively simple. But they've changed their terms and conditions a little while ago, and the requirements on indemnity and insurance are. Well, I would say technically impossible to meet, but um, you sort of we ended up we did eventually find a sort of meaningful compromise. But we probably battled with that for ten months before we were able to actually get the permit in place. Um, and we will require another one if we then start drilling for the bridge abutments, etc. But now at least we do know the process and and stuff. Um, you then obviously get a whole range of ecology permits and environmental permits. Um, I am not an expert on these by any stretch, and I I will skim over the ones that apply to us. But I think um, I believe that our next webinar might be in ecology and environment. So I suspect it'll come up a bit more then. Um, in our cases, we do have two badger sets that are within the scope of our project. Um, we have recently created a new badger set separately from the site and the badgers have been tempted in by peanut butter and colour TV or whatever, I'm not really sure, but um, they've been tempted in and we have got proof that they are finding it and using it. So we're now able to finish the process of closing the existing sets because they're basically on the line of where we need to build. Um, you've then got sort of more general environmental permits. So in this case, this is specifically about the ones that um, would be required for the EA, particularly for building or working within close proximity of the river. Um, we're not actually we don't actually need to apply for these at the moment because we're not getting close to the river in this first phase, but we will do eventually. Um, we then have water resource licenses. Um, as I said earlier, we will be owning and operating this section of canal, not Derbyshire County Council. Um, because of that, we are essentially a new user of the water. So we have to apply to abstract the water from the existing section of the Chesterfield Canal into the new section of the Chesterfield Canal. Um, and we potentially have to apply for various discharge licenses associated with that. We're currently in some early stage discussions with the EAO for exactly what's required. Um, we're not a navigation authority as the, as the Canal Trust, whereas the council is. Um, that does cause us a few issues in the fact that we can't apply any of the um, sort of opportunities for navigation authorities in terms of water resource licenses. So when we get to future sections, we would potentially have to apply to impound the water at each stage and abstract it at each stage, etc. But I think we'll have addressed the navigation authority question before we get there, because I really don't want to have to apply for 18 different abstraction and impound licenses when we get further down um the problem that i say there will almost certainly be more ecology and licenses than i've put on there but th that's our our current scheme um the clay planning consent is purely because we are being donated a large stockpile of clay um and we have to move that from where it currently is stored onto site they have consent to do that but we need to vary it slightly to, to change where it goes to and to increase the load rate that we can bring onto site um that is a mineral consent so that's dealt with by county rather than normal planning permission which would be dealt with by um, district and then uh the last one on that list is the approval in principle which is just a basically the transpennine trail bridge which is the big bridleway bridge that we're building that goes that will be adopted by the local authority obviously the process for that basically starts with the preparation of an approval in principle document which sets out the um the principles of how the bridge is going to be built what it's going to be made of what it's 
what what its design criteria are, etc. And then that goes to the local authority to be approved. Um, that's in at the moment. And then once that's been approved, then we will enter into a, uh, I think in this case, it's a Section 38 agreement, which is a, an agreement by the local authority to adopt infrastructure that's been built by somebody else, basically. Um, there was a bit of a question over exactly which agreement, because um, I can't remember exactly what Section 38 sort of more typically refers to, but it's not quite so commonly used for bridges, um, but uh, it, they do have reasonably broad powers under that section. So that's where it will fall. Um, and then obviously at the beginning, I talked about sort of the section 278, um, which is adoption of a highway. There's also drainage adoption um, that, that will be addressed in uh, in this separately. So that is a very, very whistle stop tour through the some of the consents and con and like an agreements that we're dealing with. Um, and I finish with a slide, which is basically just to say, this is what, of course, we're all doing it for, isn't it? We actually, none of us actually sit here to fill paperwork in and stuff. We actually just want to restore the canal at the end of the day. So um, I will stop there and leave some time, hopefully, for some questions. Thank you for that, George. Hang on, let me get my picture up. Apparently. Um, thanks, George. Yep, they're brilliant, really in depth information and lots. It makes it quite frightening the amount of permissions and licenses and everything else that's that's going there. Part whilst you were on um talking about the um planning permissions, Susan put in the chat for anybody who didn't notice that. Canal and River Trust are a statutory consultee for all planning applications which could affect the network. And we offer a free pre-planning consultation process which can help to iron out any concerns before you submit and pay for a formal application. So that's worth people noting if they're in the, uh, in, in the necessary area. Uh, in the Q&As, Terry um, added a few extra consents we have had to get our British yeah. oil pipeline, uh, inland drainage board, and EW water. Yeah, yeah, the EA one I came to a bit later on, didn't yeah. I? But yes, I, uh, I, I knew Terry would not let me down by um, finding a few that I had managed to miss. <laughs> Um, and I, I mean, actually, it raises an interesting point because ultimately um, the, the sort of British oil pipeline, that's one of those classics in terms of you can have all sorts of different utilities crossing the, crossing the canal. I mean, you know, as I said earlier, we've got a we've got two Yorkshire water sewers. We have two seven Trent water mains and um, we're in a split area for sewage and clean water. And then we've got a Cain gas main. So they are all going to require some form of agreement and license at some point. Um two or possibly three of those five are going to have to be diverted in some form. Um, a bit further on, when we get to the river, we go underneath the 400 kV power line. So that'll require a certain amount of agreements with um, with with, with uh, uh, National Grid. Um, so, yeah, th th there's a lot of things. I mean, we've got further up, there's a, and again, there's a coal mine discharge pipe. So that'll require some level of consent with the, with the coal authority so yeah there's a lot of those um and inter in internal drainage board ones is ones that's interesting because i am very unconscious of them but i have had no, not yet had to deal with them so i look forward to that that joy <laughs> thank you chris nash where are you buying consultancy services do you usually ask them to handle making the agreements and consents um so it varies to be honest um in general we ask in general we get the consultants to prepare the relevant information for a consent um but we would actually be the ones to submit it and handle the discussions with the um with the the granting authority it varies um that's certainly the case for sort of what we would do for planning for example things like the coal authority permit once we'd address the insurance issues that was the last one we needed was applied for by the design team because they were the ones actually doing the ground investigation. Um, some of the stuff that the contractors need to input again, we will um they will input and we will submit. But 
there will be some things like the temporary rights of way diversions that they will apply for directly. Um, so in all, in all honesty, it varies depending on the consent and the level of sometimes the level of control that we feel that we need as a, as a client and the level of relationship we already have with the granting authority. Um, you know, like with planning, it's easier for us to make those applications and have those dis conversations with the planners than it is necessarily for the designers or the or the contractors because they don't have that pre-existing relationship and that sort of pre-existing knowledge of where the schemes come from and gone to so uh, it varies thank you martin hollis what tips can you share for getting the environment agency on side well um when I know, I'll let you. I'll let you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't have um, I don't have a huge amount of relationship with the environment agency, to be honest. Um, largely because we haven't had to deal with them for a while. Um, there were a lot of discussions at one point about around the aqueduct and stuff, but we've never we've not needed to get there yet. So we're um, we are basically going through the formal sort of pre-application process for the water resource licenses, for example. Um, we have some in some sort of lead in from the relationship I have with the county council and their existing relationships with the EA that sort of help help a bit. But um, the honest answer is it's one of the problems that I'm very much looking to try and solve in the next couple of years is how we build a better relationship with the EA locally. Because I should say one of the things about the water licenses is um, they have quite explicitly said to the county council, um, do not assume that you will be allowed to take water for the for, for an onward section of canal. So at this precise moment in time, we are potentially building a section of canal that we wouldn't actually be able to fill with water. Um, so it's quite important that we address that. But yeah, no, no clear tips. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Bill Nicholson. Was the application determined by officers or committee? Um, this went to committee. Um, I think... I don't necessarily think it was I don't think it was called into committee by um by anybody. I think it just went into committee because it's classed as a major application in the um in the borough. Thank you. And Paul Morgan, if the complete restoration may take 30 plus years, is it best to apply for permission for the complete restoration restoration and once work starts? For the complete yeah. restoration and once yeah. work starts on any section, does yeah, that yeah. guarantee the permission in perpetuity yeah. or is it time limited? Um, so I, I suspect Paul probably knows the answer to this question by the way he's asked it. But um, yes, so generally, generally once a planning consent is granted, you will have three years to start. And once you have made a, a meaningful start and you do need to have a conversation with your planning authority about what a meaningful start means, um, but if you've made a meaningful start within that three years, then, then yes, the existing consent is live and stays live. I don't believe there's any time limit on it. Um, certainly, we have an existing consent for a for section further up that was um, the Derbyshire County Council applied for. That was granted in 2007, and um, we're still relying on that for certain bits of work that are happening at the moment. Um, so... On some level, yes, it's wise to apply for it all. I, I, the only thing I would say to that, from my perspective, is that if you think it's going to take thirty years to deliver that element of, you know, that section of works, you're potentially putting a lot of time and energy and investment into a planning application where you're not going to be able to do a lot of that work um, for a long time. And planning applications are not cheap. I mean, the actual planning fee, as I said, is capped because ultimately it's an engineering operation but for anything that um for all the reports etc that you've got to put into it it's quite it, it's quite expensive um i mean we reckoned our application we allocated twenty five thousand. um that was external costs that did not include any of the time that i spent on it um and it was a significant chunk of my time for nearly a year um you know, I wrote the planning statement and managed all the consultants, etc. So if you if you had to get a planning consultant to do a lot of that as well, you'd very easily be going over 50 grand, I would have thought. So it very much depends on how much you want to spend and 
you know, do you want to just do a little bit and get going or do you want to try and solve all the problems? And, and ultimately that can only be a, an assessment that you make as a society, really. OK, thank you. Terry, are the bridges built in accordance to the bridges manual? <laughs> I'm sure you know what that means. Uh, uh, design manual for roads and bridges, I suspect, is what Terry means. Um, uh, not specifically, but, um, in this case, um, the the TPT bridge, as I say, is being is a is a bridle way bridge that's being adopted, and that um, we given you you basically set out all the criteria anyway, so that gets set out in the AIP, and the other ones are private vehicular bridge. So um, it'll all be broadly in line with the DMRB, but not uh, it's not something we're specifically setting out to do. Thank you. I'm going through them as quick as I can. We've got quite a few. Bill <laughs> Nicholson, feeling, felling, felling licenses, licenses from Forestry England if volume of trees yeah. to be felled exceeds a certain level. Yeah, I would agree. That is a that is another consent that I don't have on my list. I don't have it on my list because from from the consent that we're dealing with, the point of view, um, once you've got the planning consent for that area, um, you are automatically able to grab to fell what you need to within a certain uh, within your planning boundaries, I think that's I think that's correct. Certainly, we I mean we don't have very much to fell to be honest in our areas in, in this this current bit. Okay, I've lost my track. Um, Sam, um, do the consents apply to the re re line area? Red, red line area. Red line. Sorry, I'm glad you're reading it. Red line area or just the works detail? I, uh, is there a minor variation? Um, there was a minor variation. Uh, so I'm not necessarily entirely sure on the, what the question means, but I will do my best in that um, ultimately the consent applies within your red line. That, that That's the that's what the red line is. It's the boundary of your planning consent. Um, it, within that, you will normally have, a, a, there will be a planning condition that sets out all the drawings and sometimes all the reports that it is in that your consent is granted in accordance with and that your works need to proceed based on. Therefore, if you if you need to change anything, so you have a minor variation, it would generally then be dealt with as a variation of the condition um, of that condition. So you would basically say you would basically apply for permission to replace drawing X with drawing Y, where drawing Y shows what has been what has changed. If it goes outside the red line boundary, though, at that point, it it, it, it you can't vary the red line by by a by a variation. So at that point, it was uh, it would need to be a new application. Okay, thank you, John Myers. How did you start talking to Seven Trent? I've got a lock with one of their water mains going through it, and I want to restore. All I can say is I hope you've got deep pockets. <laughs> Um, yeah, we we are in discussions about say two water mains, and we are talking. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but we're going in. We're talking seven figure sums for both of them, um, so not cheap. Um, in terms of talking to Seven Trent, we uh, I think our design team would have just gone to the would have gone to technical inquiries, or you, I mean, you 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 have to apply for information on where the water mains are, which they don't know anyway. Um, and then uh, and then the conversation started. I think. The first thing we would have actually done in any detail would be to apply for what is a C3 estimate for the diversion, um, uh, which is comes with a small fee. It was about £700, I think. We applied for the C3 estimate. They told us it was going to cost multiple seven figures. And we um, then have to submit a further um, load of information and some more funding for them to then upgrade that to a C4 estimate, which is the more detailed estimate for construction. Um, but as part of that C4 estimate, they want to know where the water mains are because they don't know themselves and uh, they're currently estimating that it will cost. They're currently quoting us about 50 grand just to do the trial holes to expose the water mains. So, um, yeah, very difficult. Oh, dear. Uh, Martin Hollis, where does one find six million plus for canal restoration? <laughs> I mean, I think we're possibly stretching a little bit off the consensus <laughs> with that question, but I will answer it. Um, I mean, so Fair. from our point of view, the funding is largely coming from the Towns Fund government programme um, for uh, part of the levelling up agenda. Um, 
the short answer on where does one find six million it's incredibly difficult there are almost no sources out there um you are basically reliant largely on the likes of heritage lottery and you will not get six million in one go from them you'll have to work up to it um or you are looking at sort of central government um you know government funding programs etc uh there used to be stuff under the eu frameworks etc but that's obviously all gone now um so in our case we got lucky to be honest we 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 heard about the towns fund we heard it was going to come to Staveley. we did everything possibly that we possibly could to make sure we were represented in the organ in the group of people that were going to be determining who got the money and that helped us to get a large chunk of the money but very 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 difficult yeah not a lot of money around out there these days and uh, yeah. i mean one of, one of the future um webinars we're looking at is the funding after you've um, got the restoration done. Uh, it's no good doing one on getting funding because there isn't much there to talk about at the minute. So, sorry, we no yeah. help on that I think, one. I think, I mean, it's worth saying there's a lot of small sources out there. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're doing at the moment is we are sort of having more of a push on uh, doing smaller ones. But, um, yeah, it's uh, it's um, very tricky. So yeah. I'll carry on. Um and then, Chris... and I know I noticed Chris. I was just say I was yeah. going to just come to Chris's comment because I'm, I know he's put it in the the Q, in the Q and A. But yes, it is a good point actually about the EA, which is the local catchment partnerships. Um, so yes, I I do go to the local catchment partnership. I do have relationships with the EA through that. Um, um, and I actually sit on the steering group for the local catchment partnership. The, the only thing I would say about that, in my limited experience, is that. The EA is another one of these organisations that's really quite siloed and that often, <laughs> whilst the catchment partnership coordinator and et cetera can be really good and, you know, really understanding, they even they seem to struggle to find the right person elsewhere in the EA to talk to. It's, um, it's an interesting organisation. Terry's got his hand up, so I'll just, uh, if you're OK, I'll bring him on just to say whatever he's going to say. Keep it, it's got to keep it short there though, we. Terry. There we, Terry. Go on. I, I was just going to say, well done, George and Susan. I think, yeah, really good topic, really good um, background information. It would be brilliant to take something of this and write it up and circulate it as almost a guidance note, because I think there's a lot of people out there, including me, that have stumbled our way through some of this. And it's good to share the pitfalls that you've hit George along the way with what you've been doing. It can help everyone. Yeah, I think that's um, a very good point. I think that's something we shall certainly consider, perhaps at the next high level panel meeting when we have one. Um, <laughs> but yes, no, I definitely, definitely. And I think the other thing, um, as I sort of alluded to right at the beginning, I think if there's stuff that's come up today that um, anybody feels oh, I'd really like to know more specific information just about that certain consent or that particular topic, then, um, you know, please do let Jenny and Emma and co know and we will uh, we'll find a way to get it in the programme. Uh, Sam's just asked where the videos of the webinar are, please, because he can't find them. I believe they're on YouTube, are they, Verena? Most of them are. Uh, some of the last ones haven't been put there already. So we, we will do that for sure. And we can uh, share the link once done. OK. And Chris says, again, thanks for the information provided today. And he agrees also a written guidance would help everyone. So this might be something we're going to have to have a look at. Um, that keep us quiet, won't it? Um, so, yeah. yeah. Bill, a useful webinar. I look forward to the environment coming up, covering biodiversity net gain. Don't seem to be on the IWA one. We'll sort you out, Sam. We'll we'll send you the links to the to the webinars. So thank you very much. But I'll hand over to Emma to do the the thank yous. Okay, so that's it then. That's um, wrapping up today's webinar. Just would like to thank our uh, speakers, Sue and George, again, for taking the time to deliver the webinar and to Verena and Jenny for facilitating the session. Um, thank you to everyone that joined and sharing your thoughts, questions and experiences with us. Um, we'll be editing the recording and a link will be sent out once it's been done. Um, the next webinar organised by the IWA and um, Canal and River Trust 
as Jenny said, will be in November. The date will be confirmed, but it will be on environment and then ecology for restoration work. Um, so just keep an eye out for any links on the website, Facebook pages. We'll send them out ready for you to book on. Um, so in the meantime, um, just like I say, keep up to date on the website, Canal and River Trust, IWA's websites and on any Facebook groups. And I'd just like to thank again for joining us and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>